So um, we're, I'm going to um, I'm going to introduce you to Bernadette O'Connor. Um, we're going to shift the gear here. Bernadette is a beautiful energy, and you're going to learn from her. She's a beautiful making magic happen press author, which is another publishing press that I own, and you, you're going to be inspired. Come on ahead, Bernadette. based in Ireland and it has called me to come here and, and bring her home to Ireland. So I do have some notes because I want to, I want to honour that calling properly. So my dad was an Irishman, very proud Irishman, but he left when he was 15 and made his way around the world into Australia, but he was a storyteller. And he could hold a group of people, whether it was his four children or a bar full of mates, for hours with his stories, <coughs> his tales of adventure from around the world. Now, I think I've inherited my dad's storytelling ability, but where dad's stories were more lighthearted, and they always, always ended in him descending into fits of laughter, or perhaps I should say ascending into fits of laughter, my storytelling is slightly different. Um, I'm quite deep, mm. I go very deep. So my stories are often woven with, with soul lessons and healing and uh, the chance for wisdom to be imparted with people. I'm fortunate that I, I write fiction. They're the stories that have been gifted to me. But I really believe in the power of story as a creator of change. So my non-author role in life is I'm an energy practitioner. Some people at home call me a white witch. <laughs> However, so I work with people to help them heal. I, I help to connect with their energy body and bring them back to who they really are. And in 2016, having always written, but never actually written a book, a story landed with me. And that was my first book, Let's Go Home. And that story just one Saturday morning came and hit me. And I just would simply sit at my computer, listening to music and write. Um, and Let's Go Home is a modern girl's tale of pain and trauma, but her finding her way home to who she really is. It's a beautiful book. Let's Go Home, her, the character Harley is quite, you know, a New Yorker modern girl. She called me in 20, she was launched in 2018, beginning of 2018, halfway through 2018, she said, I want to go to Hollywood. I want to be adapted to film. So, you know, Karen and I, we chatted, as we do, and one door opened and then another, and Let's Go Home made her way into the Oscars gift bag in February of this year. And she's currently sitting in the hands of an international film producer. So Harley might very well have her day on the screen one day, which I suppose is my vision. Again, not for the fame and the glory of any of that. But I believe, like I said, in the power of story as a creator of change. And if through film, I can help young women, older women, to grow and evolve and become more powerful and express who they really are in the world, then, then that's what I'm going to do. And I listen to my characters. So, Beneath the Veil was launched in February this year. The day before, her big sister ended up in that Oscars gift bag. Beneath the Veil called me to bring her home. And so that's why I'm here. Karen enticed me with writing my third book in a castle. And I said, why not? Um, but really, I'm here beyond this retreat to take Beneath the Veil and see her in Ireland, because she's based in Ireland. It's the story of Clara, a seven-year-old girl, who has a voice, she's fiery, she's passionate, and that gets suppressed. She undergoes extreme trauma at the hands of her brother, her mother who doesn't stand up for her, her father who turns a blind eye. She gets married off and gets abused so that she can have a child. 
She gets cleansed by a priest because she's seen as carrying the devil when she miscarries that baby. And then she gets sent away to the Magdalene laundries. Now, I had a conversation with my cousin's wife, Pamela, on Friday. I arrived on Thursday and I went and spent time with Pamela. And Pamela said to me, now Bernadette, I love you dearly. I love you dearly. This is the Midlands for me. So you know these Irish Midlands. I love you dearly, but I can't get past that first chapter. She said, how did you write it? You know, did you just read up on people's stories? And I said, no. I, I said, they came to me, Clara, her aunt Maeve, Cynthia, they came to me and they asked me to write their story and I just wrote it. And I said, I didn't even know what the Magdalene laundry was. I knew that Clara was going to be deemed as evil and dirty and a bad girl and insane and sent away somewhere. I'd seen that. But I didn't know about the Magdalene laundry and it was the week I was about to write that scene because I see everything as scenes. And something came across my Facebook feed, as it was. And it was an article written by Sinead O'Connor prior to the Pope coming to Ireland last year about being sent away to the Magdalene Laundry. And I went, I won't insert the word, but you can imagine, that's where Clara ends up. And I said that to Pamela, I didn't even know. And she said, do you know your mother got sent away when she was 13? And I said, I didn't. And she said, take a cup of tea, come into the drawing room. And we went and sat by the fire and she told me the story of her mother. And I kind of want to share that with you because it really made me sit there and go, now I know why I'm here in Ireland. Because when you're half Irish, but you're an Australian, and you get gifted with a story about Irish women, you think, I'm not entitled to come and tell you, Irish women, how to heal the pain of your past. Who am I to do that? I'm just going to read a little excerpt because I've really struggled with that for about the past few months. How am I going to go and do this and take this story? But Clara struggled with that same thing. Her aunt Maeve said to her, I should have my glasses on, <laughs> her aunt Maeve said to her, it's not just about you anymore, Clara. You were doing this work for all those women who came before you and all those who will come after you. Those women who never had the chance to heal themselves and for all those women who will never have this chance. In rising in your power, you lead the way for other women to do the same. To which Clara says, why don't you just leave me well enough alone? How can a farm girl like me in the middle of nowhere on the west coast of Ireland change the world? I think all your queer team may be messing with your head now. So how can me, an Australian woman, come to Ireland and inspire change in Irish women? And I sat there and I listened to Pamela tell me about her mother, who got taken to Magdalene Laundry in Dublin when she was 13, the day after she turned 13. Her mother went with her. Her mother had been told she was going to go and buy her some clothes. <coughs> Remiss of me to mention that Pamela's mother went by, she was part of the inquiry into the Magdalene laundries, which resulted in the government, the Irish government, not the Catholic Church, issuing an apology to those women who'd been sent. This uh, Pamela's mother was regarded as number five. She was person number five. She didn't have an identity in the, in the Magdalene laundry, she was just number five. So number five was the eldest girl of 21 children. Listen to that, girls. 21 <coughs> children, you imagine it. Um, and on the day after her 13th birthday, she got taken. And her father presented her to the mother superior. And he said, she's your problem now. And he walked away taking her mother screaming <coughs> in the room. She was in the Magdalene laundry for 13 years, a tiny girl. There's photos of her where she scrubbed sheets from hospitals and hotels in Ireland. And she saw horrific abuse at the hands of the nuns. When she was 16, she got, excuse the expression, she got pimped out by the nuns to a wealthy Dublin family. And for three years she worked there. And every Friday the nuns would come and collect the pay paycheck and take her back to the Magdalene Laundry. When she was 18, she got sent home to her father who had 
who had secured a job in the local hotel as a cook. She rode 32 miles there and back every day for six weeks. And then the, then the owner of the <coughs> hotel put her up. She worked there every day for six years. And every Friday afternoon, her father would come and collect her paycheck and she never saw his hand. When she had four children, married with four children, and still working part-time, her father would come every Friday afternoon and collect half of her paycheck. And the tragedy is that on the day that I arrived in Ireland, number five received the last payment of compensation from the Irish government. And she rang Pamela as I sat beside her and she said, I got the last of that money. And she said, what do I need it for as an 82-year-old woman? I suppose it'll bury me. So, and I realised that we can't bury those stories because we have to heal them so that Irish women, so that the descendants of Irish women and women all over the world heal the pain of their past and rise into their power, to become powerful, empowered women, <coughs> so that we see ourselves as equal to any man. And this is not about women's lib. This is about seeing ourselves as equal and in harmony. And that's the type of change I want to see in the world. So I came, I positioned this little talk as an email launching beneath the veil in Ireland. But I'm not launching, I'm planting. I'm planting beneath the veil in Ireland. So when I'm home with my babies and my husband, I can trust that Clara and Maeve and those amazing women that make up beneath the veil will do the work and will inspire change. So that you young girls grow up knowing that you are powerful, knowing you are equal, and that you do it differently to your grandmothers and your great grandmothers.